Welcome back everyone, this is Dave from Corn Productions here to talk about The X-Files Season 1, Episode 7, Ghost in the Machine. The episode's description reads as follows. On Halloween, Mulder and Scully investigate the death of a corporate executive who may have been murdered by a thinking computer. The episode was written by Alex Gonza and Howard Gordon. I talked about this duo before. They were last responsible for Conduit. The only episode written by Gonza that I consider a home run this season is Fallen Angel. Gordon, on the other hand, would go on to have a much better track record. According to Internet Movie Database, Gordon cites this episode as the most disappointing that he worked on. The episode was directed by Gerald Freeman. This is his first of two stints on the series. He also directed an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents and MacGyver. The episode originally aired on October 29th, 1993. Before going any further, I'll tell you a couple of things. One, this is not a spoiler-free podcast. If you haven't watched the episode, I recommend you go and check it out and then come back and give me a listen. Secondly, if you're listening to one of the platforms that this podcast is now available on, please follow and feel free to check out my YouTube channel, Corn Productions, where additional con- con- content can be discovered. If you're already on my YouTube channel, please like, share, and comment, and subscribe to my channel. A couple of shout-outs. One that I forgot to mention last time was Dicey Mike saying the Jersey Devil video that this was quality content and i very much thank you for that also ashley wright says that he is surprised to hear that there is a season of television that i liked less than quantum leap season two all right so i liked season two of quantum leap about halfway and then there's a lot of mediocre episodes towards the end of the season that uh, i found myself disliking And then in Season 3, there were only like four episodes that I circled as potentially not liking them too much and thinking they might be bad episodes. And almost all of those episodes improved upon rewatch. I said in the past that there are very few actual bad episodes of Quantum Leap. Most of them fall in, at the very least, the okay range. Uh, As I've said previously, Season 1 of The X-Files is very much a mixed bag. Some absolute classics... The next episode, for instance, Ice, mixed in with a whole lot of Drek. Unlike Quantum Leap, there were plenty of bad episodes in the run of the original X-Files and in the revival. And of course, there were also good to great episodes. Unfortunately, this episode is not one of them. The concepts of this episode had a lot of promise, dealing with AI and the concept of smart homes, which we are seeing more and more come to fruition during the current day. The concept of a smart home and smart buildings dates back a lot further than you might think, with the concept for a fully automated house appearing in 1939. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw that in science fiction even before that. The technology didn't really start to gain any kind of traction until 1975, and has really taken off in our current modern times. And of course, AI has become a hot topic issue in the present day. This episode is 20 plus years ago and is ahead of its time. So there was plenty of potential in the ideas presented here. Unfortunately, the execution was poorly done and we ended up with a boring episode that wastes an appearance from Jerry Harden as Deep Throat and a potentially excellent concept. Also, I don't love some of Scully's characterization in this episode either. The episode also has the distinction of being named after a movie that aired the same year, also called Ghost in the Machine, starring Karen Allen. The episode opens at the Eurisco building. Benjamin Drake, played by Tom Butler, who I best remember as Quinn Mallory's dad on Sliders, he made two appearances in that series, a show that eventually might be covered on this channel, is arguing with Brad Wycheck, played by Rob Bell, who has made a career out of playing the scientist guy. He has appearances in Eureka and Smallville, as, as well as a regular on First Wave. Here, especially in this scene, his performance is pretty unconvincing. In fact, they are both real bad in this scene, and both have done good work elsewhere. Brad is telling him that he's killing his company, But it's not his company anymore because it was apparently taken from him. After Drake is being watched by a camera talking about eliminating the COS project because of a disastrous performance, he goes to the bathroom with an overflowing sink. And no kidding about that bad performance. He gets a phone call from no one and is promptly killed by electrocution. Me gets the sneaking feeling that the COS 
had something to do with it. Credits. When we come back, we see Agent Jerry walking through the halls of the FBI. He's played by Wayne Duvall, who had a very nice career for himself, 113 credits, including one for Lincoln. The succession-like show Billions is his acting prowess is not visible in this episode, which, you know what, to come to think of it, pretty much everybody in this episode, outside of maybe Jerry Harden, is pretty bad. He takes a piece of candy from a pumpkin, and this should have been our first hint that he was up to no good. He finds Mulder and Scully buying lunch out of a basket in the middle of the office. That's just kind of sad. He gives Mulder a hug as they used to be partners. No, not that way. He gives Scully a look like he thinks she might be jealous that he had partners before her. It's a universal construct that someone from Mulder and Scully's past shows up, that that person, and this happens often in season one, that they will either be dead or discovered to be up to no good by the end of the hour. Jerry pretty much turns out to be both. He offers to buy them lunch, and if you're going to do that, maybe buy a lunch from somewhere that isn't in the middle of the office. But I guess that's not what we're going to do here. Uh, we discover that they work together in violent crimes. Wow. In the X-Files office, Jerry gives them the rundown of the case. Jerry wants Mulder's help, saying he could really use the help. A win for him would really help his career. Scully asks why they split up on the walk to the Oresco building, and Mulder says they had a different career goals. Jerry wanted a big career, and Mulder was gunning for the basement. Jerry lost evidence that hurt his career. Scully and Mulder board a talking elevator overseen by the evil COS, and the elevator gets stuck. It only gets unstuck after Scully makes a phone call, and this is presumably a ploy by the COS to get Scully's information. Jerry, Mulder, and Scully meet at the crime scene, where they also run into the building's, the building's system engineer. He's played by Blue Mankuma. He has 213 credits for him, and he's actually pretty decent in this episode as well, but he's barely in it. There's plenty of conversation, including who could have switched things up so the boss would go kablooey. Mulder asks a question about the phones, and Jerry asks him why after. And, as it turns out, the phone is off the hook. He might have been talking to the killer. Jerry jokingly says he taught Mulder everything he knows. And you know, it is a joke, but given how this episode goes, it wouldn't surprise me at all if he actually tried to convince people that that was in fact the case. Back at Mulder's office, Mulder is looking for his notes, which he can't seem to find. Scully busts on him for basically not cleaning his office in years. I mean, she hasn't worked with him for that long, so how would she even know that? But anyway, Mulder can't find his notes, Scully says they're going to be late, and so Mulder leaves to the meeting without his notes. Jerry, meanwhile, is presenting the case to the agent in charge and uses Mulder's profile like it's his own, something that does not go unnoticed, but he downplays it to Scully. Jerry is congratulated for his good work while getting the death stare from Mulder. Or at least, that's what I think it's supposed to be. The company is not particularly convincing here. But then again, he shares that distinction with almost everybody in this episode. Mulder confronts Jerry, who said he didn't think Mulder would mind. Well, clearly you were wrong about that. Jerry doesn't see what the big deal is, and he ends up going away. Scully ends up asking, well, what did he say? And Mulder said Jerry apologized in his own way. Uh, actually, from my vantage point over here, it seems like he apologized in no way. But that's just me. Scully comes back with a list of suspects, and when she know it, the only one on the list is Brad Wycheck. Mulder doesn't buy that, but they go and talk to him anyway. They drive to his rather impressive-looking house. It's clear he wasn't hurt very much by no longer being a part of the company. Brad talks about how his own vision conflicted from Drake's vision. He's giving himself a motive, and he doesn't even seem to realize it. When he does realize that he's a suspect, he doesn't seem particularly concerned. And I'm guessing that's probably because he didn't do it. In her apartment, Scully monologues about Brad being a suspect. And then, and then, when she goes to bed or something, she gets her computer hacked by the COS, as we see it at work doing its thing. Mulder and Scully listen to ta tapes of Brad when Jerry walks in, apologizing. Mulder forgives him, and Jerry reveals professional jealousy. Uh, okay, over what exactly? I mean, your career is not doing any, any good, but Mulder's career isn't any better than yours, Jerry. 
and he seemed to miss that fact. Scully performs some tech mumbo jumbo to compare voices and basically implicates Brad as the killer. Jerry goes to arrest him and tells Mulder he needs this win. Brad is trying to get into the system at home but can't seem to do so, so he drives off to the Uresco building. He's followed by Jerry. The COS notices Jerry following him into the building and basically kills him in the elevator despite Brad's, Brad's protests and attempts to stop it. So long, Jerry. I'm not going to miss you any. Mulder is despondent. Doesn't think Brad killing Jerry makes any sense. And Scully points out that he confessed. Mulder shouldn't need any more evidence than that, says Scully. And eh, I don't know about that. A lot of people give false confessions. And I think you would probably know that, Scully. Mulder goes to Brad's, but is shooed away by the law enforcement at the scene that have a higher clearance, despite the fact that he was the one that commissioned the warrant in the first place. He then goes and chills out with Deep Throat. Deep Throat is not thrilled to be there. I am thrilled to have him there, though. He goes on to talk about the artificial intelligence the Defense Department may have an interest in, and Brad developed a computer that actually thinks. The Holy Grail. Well, hello there, Jerry. I miss you, Harden. Good seeing you for that five minutes. And I guess we'll see you for a little bit longer at the end of this episode, but still. Mulder goes to the prison to talk to Brad. Mulder knows he's innocent and protecting the machine. Brad says he's not and compares himself to Oppenheimer, who regretted his part in building the bomb. Brad doesn't want to share his work with an immoral government. He asks Brad to tell him how to destroy the system. Mulder tells Scully that Brad has a virus. And Scully thinks the AI abilities he's talking about is decades away and says Mulder is looking for things that aren't there and it has something to do with Jerry. Oh, for cripes sake, Scully, please stop with the psychoanalysis. This is pretty standard Mulder behavior to me, so I don't know what you're talking about. Mulder visits Brad again and gives him the computer to write the virus. Scully sleeps and gets a prank call from the murderous COS. I hate when that happens. Mulder goes to the Uresco building with the virus. Scully coincidentally shows up because she knows that something from there has been breaking into her computer. And Mulder surmises, correctly, that it's the machine. They drive into the building, trying to get into the parking garage, which tries to kill them, unsuccessfully. Obviously. Because it would be a very short series if it did in fact manage to kill them. Anywho, Mulder and Scully make their way into the building, with the building attempting to do everything it can to stop them and to try to kill them. Mulder and Scully end up getting separated. Mulder gets to where he needs to go and encounters the engineering guy who is actually working for the State Department. Or at least it is implied that he is. We never actually get who he is working for. But this is hardly a shocking reveal. After Mulder gets access, the engineering guy holds a gun on him. But Scully who survived the building trying to kill her, shows up just in time to help out Mulder. There's some back and forth before Mulder inserts the virus and seemingly kills the machine. Mulder talks to Deep Throat, and Brad has disappeared. He's in trouble, and he's bargaining with the government. Deep Throat says the machine is dead, and then leaves. Only, we see that's not quite true. It's only playing dead as we see a light come on. It has the Department of Defense guy in its sights as he says he's going to figure this thing out if it kills him. And it might just. Yep, that's where the episode ends. Like I said, not a very good episode. But there is good news. The next episode that we are going to cover is Ice, which is a classic episode of the series. Followed by Space, which is the next episode after that. That is probably one of the worst in the entire series. Season 1 of The X-Files is a very rocky road, as you can tell. Anyway, that's all I got for you for this video. If you like this video and want to support the channel, there are a number of ways to do so. You can follow me on Twitter at Corn Productions. You can join one of my Corn Productions Facebook pages. You can buy something from the Corn Productions store on Zazzle. You can buy me a copy, which is a new way to support content creators such as myself. And of course, you can like, share, and comment on this video as well as subscribing to my channel. This is Dave from Corn Productions. Signing off.